Craig. Welcome to the True Wealth Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn. In studio today with me, Matt Dixon. And this is, of course, the greatest Tuesday you've had all week. Are we you are ready? Stoked to be here. Um, and so we have a delightfully loosely scripted show today. Yeah. But I think this may be one of the topics that is of highest interest to our listeners perhaps ever in the history well, of topics. I was going to go as far as to say, David, do you realize this might be the best show we ever do without yes. a script? It's possible it's just the best show that's ever happened, ever. Yep. Have I'm we ready. oversold it yet? No, we're, we're underselling it. Yeah, yeah, let's go for it. Look, we got to thinking about what is something that we could talk about that would be really useful for investors, right, yep. in general. And, you know, we talk about all kinds of stuff. The, the reality is right now, market's really difficult to handicap. You and don't know which way it's headed. Yeah, it's, Everyone's it's all trying to figure it out. And if someone knew, well, they'd be a billionaire. Right, so that's the, the, the first issue here. Market's tough to handicap. Then we talked about the news cycle. And yeah, it's just a bunch of everybody should hate everybody else. Per the usual, nothing yeah. new there. So then we got to thinking, well, how could we provide some value to our listeners? Yeah. Okay? And uh, we, we started asking the question, so you know, there's a bunch of things that we take for granted as financial professionals. Is that it because not everybody we knows. assume people know stuff that they don't actually know? Maybe. Yeah. It may be that. And so we thought about it. So, well, what if we were to do a show that was really built to say, what is available to investors at various stages of investment? From like, you're brand new, you've never done this, and I don't even know how it works, all the way up to, hey, we've got a lot going on here, where should I be headed with this? Right. And so I think today what we're gonna do is attempt to help investors figure out where am I and what is available to me. I wanna say what options are available to me, but right. when I say options, option is an actual type of investment. Do you and think so it we'll could be... kinda touch on like what, helping people identify what they need so that they know like not only what's available but what do i kind of need given my circumstance no oh, i mean like why would we be that useful that's yeah seems like all right maybe is that asking too much yeah I, I, you know the tr the tricky part we can't give personalized investment advice there's right. a bunch of liability associated with that but what we can do is talk about the broader circumstance and what i want our listeners to be able to do today like just think about what, where you're at and, and maybe it's not just for you maybe this is something that you can help uh, somebody else right so maybe you're already an investor maybe you're a parent or a grandparent but you want to help a kid or a grandkid get started and you're thinking well how do we do that okay so i'm going to start out with the very most basic here uh, Let's talk about what are the most common investments that people buy, and and then because the show is going to kind of orbit around those a little bit. Okay? okay. Today we're not really talking about real estate a whole lot. Okay. I think that that's certainly a worthy investment, but I don't want to talk about the exotic. You're stuff. talking more like what do people actually go out of their way to invest in? That's not like well, I have to own a home because I need some place to sleep. You're talking like actually going out to invest. And I'm also talking about what might you own inside of a retirement plan. Mm -hmm. So there are some things that we could talk about, and I'm just going to sort of glance over them, right? We're not going to talk about investing inside of life insurance policies today. Nope. Too weird. Okay. We're not going to talk about buying um, art today. We're not going to talk about collectible items, like maybe you want to buy classic cars and you know mm -hmm. fix them up and flip them. Okay, that th these are all real things, by the way, but that's not the the flex today, if you will. Right. Okay. So, what I want to talk about first and foremost is some of the the standard things. So, stocks and bonds. Mm -hmm. First of all, we're going to take what are they, and then we can talk about how does somebody buy them. Okay. Right. So first. Can you tell me what is a stock and what is a bond? So a stock is where you are going out and you are buying a share or two or three or four or five, however many you want, but you're actually getting a partial ownership in that company that you are buying that stock in. Right. So it gives you the ability to vote as a shareholder in the company. So if you own one share, you get one vote because you're a part owner. 
right? right? If there's a million shares outstanding, you own one millionth of the company. Yep. Sometimes stocks are referred to as equities. Mm -hmm. Because just like the equity is the portion of a home, when, you're, when you, you have a mortgage, the part that belongs to you is the equity. The part that you're still paying for, that's the mortgage. But right. the equity is the ownership stake. Right, and then you ask the question, kind of what is a bond? Well, on the flip side, you could go get a bond where you are in essence loaning your money out to, uh, you know, it could be the government if it's a treasuries, or you could be getting a bond through a corporation where you're letting that corporation borrow your money for a certain period of time. And then they're gonna pay you some interest to borrow that money and then they're gonna return it to you at a specified date in the future. Right, so very simply, stocks are ownership, yep. bonds are loans. Yep. Okay. That's a good and there's way to terminology describe. around both of them, but we don't want to overcomplicate this today. Nope. Here's there is a challenge, right? Like if you wanted to go, out, I'm just going to try to pull up the price of something like real time here. So I'm looking at the price of um, Microsoft. Okay? okay. We talk about Microsoft. How much do you think a share of Microsoft is will cost you to purchase? Oh man, I'm going to guess it somewhere around $230. That's over 400. Is it up that? Yeah, okay. yeah, 414 dollars and one cent as of today's close. I noticed that Intel today you could buy a share of that for around 20 dollars. Right, a little over 20 bucks for a share of Intel. And this is relevant, right? Because if you and we're going to talk about how the marketplace is changing and there's more and more options for investors today than there have been mm -hmm. in a long time. Perhaps mo the most options I've ever seen in my career for investors, right? I've been doing this for 25-ish years now. Right. And so we're seeing tremendous access, okay? It used to be, if you didn't have, you need $414 to buy one share of Microsoft. Well, if you only had $100, you can't own Microsoft. Right. Okay? So it used to be, that if you wanted to own Microsoft, you could buy it through a mutual fund. Can you tell me about mutual funds for a second? Yeah, it's kind of a fancy way of saying this mutual fund group is going to go buy a bunch of different stocks from a bunch of different companies, and then they're going to value that basket of holdings and let you buy shares of that batch of holdings at a certain price. So you might be able to buy one share of the mutual fund, and that mutual fund owns you know, 500,000 shares of Microsoft, 200,000 shares of Apple. And so you're getting exposure to it, but in fractional little tiny pieces. Yeah, it's think of it as sharing in a pot of investments with other investors. So yep. a company is formed, that investment company's purpose is to pool investor monies together and then to manage them to build a shared portfolio amongst everybody that's contributed. Yeah. And so everybody gets proportion and ownership to what they've contributed. And when money wants to go into the fund, you give it to the company and then they put it to work. When you want to take money out, you go back to the company and redeem it from them and they will cash you out through either the new money coming in from new buyers or from the uh, shares bought or sold in the fund. Right. But they're going to manage this influx or outflux of investors and their money and invest it on behalf of the group. Okay, there's a cost associated with doing that. Okay? But, but that's how you would access things is through a mutual fund. That is still a perfectly viable thing to do to this day. Mm -hmm. That is available. Right. Um, we've seen some evolution. We've, uh, other instruments have arrived now, things like exchange-traded funds. They have similarities to mutual funds, and they have some differences. They trade on an exchange, so you don't necessarily have to go back to the fund company that created the fund in order to make contributions or distributions. Right. You may be able to simply sell the unit on an exchange and another investor will buy the unit directly from you and then you take the money and you go do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. okay? So an exchange traded fund is diversified like a mutual fund is. It's a whole portfolio, but it trades like an individual stock might trade. And now, I mean, that could be kind of cool, especially because here's one thing to think about. The mutual fund, it's got, they analyze the value of that once a day. Whereas in an ETF, you could sell that and have it 
execute almost instantly. Yeah, the, the, the downside of a mutual fund is that because there's money coming and going all the time, they only let you in or out at the end of the day. So they wait for all of the trades to settle and then they kind of balance them out and the final pricing is what you get. And mm -hmm. it's a little blind. You won't know the price until after the market is closed. So you submit your order and then you wait and see what the final price is gonna be. That would really suck if the market melted down at the end of the day. Yeah, it would. And then it sells it for you at the end once they total the value and you're like, gosh dang it, I was hoping to get a little bit more. Right, and so there, that is one of the dangers is that there's a certain amount of uh, blind uh, investing. It's, it's nominal typically, right. but, but nevertheless it's there. So uh, where do people go to buy these things? Okay, There's kind of three primary places. If you want to buy a stock, uh, it's pretty old fashioned, but you used to be able to go to the company itself and you could buy shares directly. Mm -hmm. and purchase them or what's through known as register and transfer. So there's a, companies out there that track the ownership of shares in various companies. Okay? You could go to a fund company and buy them through a mutual fund. Or you can now go to various brokerage organizations and what they do is they create an account that is capable of holding things where they're tracking the ownership. Okay? And, and a brokerage account is probably the most common one that you see from financial institutions. Mutual funds you often get directly, but you may own a brokerage account and not realize it. It's just kind of non-traditional. Uh, it's not a brokerage account like you think of. It's a holding account or a custodial account, and it's in your 401k, mm. right? Or perhaps you have a government pension or something. They hold mutual funds, right. and those mutual funds being held in that account, well, that's the custodian is who's holding these various mutual funds, and that's how you get your proportion and ownership and everything. Interestingly enough, you don't get voting rights in stocks through a mutual fund. The fund company votes on your behalf, mm. right? So you get representative ownership, but you don't get the same. You can't you have don't the, get the same voting benefits. Yeah. So, um, so I, let's not get lost in the weeds of the really hyper specifics of investing. What we're trying to say is investors can get started at smaller levels by buying into mutual funds or buying lower share prices. But there's also another way to do it, and it's through brokerage accounts. And the question is, is it with help or do it yourself? And there's a pretty big development that's happened in the last few years that we need to talk about. And you know what it is? I would love to know. Of course, and so would our listeners, but you have to wait until after this break. Stick around, we'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You got True Wealth on News Radio 93 9 FM at 1240 KQEN. Hey, welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. Uh, I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn, in studio today with me. Matt Dixon. Um, we are answering the question today, uh, or attempting to answer the question um, how does an investor get started? And if you already started, what are the options that are, are, are available to you? And it's really geared a little bit more towards the DIY investor today. Um, if you want to catch up on it, grab our podcast, mm -hmm. right? It's at, at our website at littlejohnfs.com. And you look under the Educate tab and you can catch this podcast. I'll post tomorrow. So um, this question, David, like, where do you start, right? Yeah. You asked that. And I want to ask you a question. Would you say that you've kind of noticed a trend where the DIY investor, like that's become a more popular thing in recent times because from my seat, I look at it and I'm like, I, I witnessed Robin Hood as an example, um, really kind of blow up and become this really big thing during COVID where a lot of people that had never touched investments before were like, hey, there's this thing where I can go trade and it's not gonna cost me anything. I'm gonna go do it. And so they got their COVID stimulus money and they started, everyone was a trader overnight. Right. Um, it was kind of this revolution. Um, do you kind of still see that as like a, a trend where people are kind of trying to do it themselves more? I love this question because uh, there's some things embedded in it. I can't answer the question. Yeah. I'm just gonna come right out and say, I don't know how to answer it. But I love the way you're asking the question because it makes me wanna ask, sort of a, another one, which is, uh, I can tell you what just, I think. Just because something is loud, does that make it true? Yeah. Right, because I think sometimes what we hear, like the loud voice is, everybody's doing Robin Hood now. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that that makes it true. I think it makes it newsworthy. I think a lot of people were. I think it was like one of those fads, right? Like you see things swing into popularity where it's like, well, Stanley Cups, right? Like everyone wanted a Stanley Cup for, 
the holiday season? Are they, is everyone still buying them, or was that just kind of a trend that was here and gone? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer, but let's get back to the original question. Um, you may have seen, a, I think you did see a real surge in popularity. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw account statistics for how many accounts Robinhood was opening. I didn't see as many statistics for how much, how many assets were being managed right. by Robinhood. Were assets going out? Yeah. Were they coming well, in? Because here's the thing. We were talking at the last segment about how people could buy mutual funds, mm -hmm. but we didn't talk about this sort of emerging trend right now where you can, you can access, like if Microsoft's a $400 plus dollar stock today, mm -hmm but you could buy a fraction of a share of Microsoft now through certain trading platforms. Robinhood was a great example. You don't have to buy a whole share of Microsoft anymore. Right. You can buy a fraction of a share. You don't get to vote, but it sort of still looks a lot like a mutual fund. You didn't get to vote there either. But Robinhood would allow you to buy a fraction of a share. And what made Robinhood really interesting is I don't think there was a trading cost for it. No, there wasn't. Right, and if you've asked, like, well, how do they do that? Well, whatever cash is in the account, that's staying in their banking system and it's being lent out. They're making money on the spread on their cash. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting. They, that, I think they were selling the orders, too. Well, they were selling remember. order flow, which yeah. is the data. They were selling information to hedge funds so that the hedge funds could see where the money was moving in their system. Right. Right. I think Citadel was one of the big ones that was involved in that at the time, uh, I think. So anyway, trying not to, you know. You almost think that would be illegal. Like, in a way, like you think like somehow that that should be. It because seems it's like, like it to me because, I mean, it's probably disclosed somewhere in the operating paperwork and mm -hmm. people just clicked yes to open the account and didn't look at it. Um, it's sort of like, hey, if you want to use your Apple phone, right, your iPhone, look at the 20 pages of disclosure. Yeah, because you read every word of it, right? Yeah. I mean, you're just like, well, I want to use the phone, so I have to deal with this because it's an all or nothing, right? Like, mm -hmm. Either you accept it, and you use the or phone, you don't get or you it. don't accept it, and you don't use the phone. And it's like, oh, that's interesting that I bought the phone, and then there's these terms, and if I want to keep using it without it becoming a paperweight, I must accept them. Right. So, uh, but I think we see that in lots of places. My larger point is, put all the other things aside, if you could buy a fraction, of you could buy $5 of Microsoft, mm -hmm. well, then now the investment size isn't the barrier to entry. Right. So you could open an account at Robinhood with, I don't know, fifty hundred dollars and start trading stocks. And I think a lot of people did that. And a lot of people did it with uh, low, low risk and they could take big bets and if they could figure out how to make something work, they would do so. There was even a few times where there were glitches in the system and people were able to do things like buy massive options Mm -hmm. where you weren't supposed to. They were like leveraging up 100 to 1. And the thing is, if they were wrong, what was Robin Hood going to do? Well, your account's at zero. Well, you need to bring us $100,000. And they go, yeah, well, let me know how that works out. Yeah. Right? They could afford to just be structurally bankrupt and there was no way to collect. But if they were right, they got the money. So they yeah. could take huge bets. Well, the problem was when Robin Hood was accurate and people were jumping in and starting to trade options and with leverage, mm -hmm. there were stories of people who went in there and lost so much money, money they didn't even have. Mm -hmm. And then when it was, you know, like, hey, you got to pay this up, people were killing themselves. Like that was a headline news article, like uneducated investors jumping into Robinhood, making bad errors and suicides. Like that was a thing and it was sad. Yeah, well, um, I wasn't gonna go that dark today. Hey, well. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the and, and incidentally, that is a, a separate aside for why you might wanna still have a pro in your corner. Is that, right. you know, you, you can, can go get out there and- into the weeds. Yeah, self-inflicted wounds are the worst ones, and that's the most common thing that uh, impedes an investor, right? Mm -hmm. the, the number one thing that makes an investor lose money is bad decisions. And, and we're not talking about well, we picked the wrong stock. It's like well, we picked a stock, but we couldn't be patient, or we got, and and so we, you know we sold with terrible timing. We got scared and bailed at the bottom. We got greedy and we bought at the top. I was going to say greed over fundamental investing, right? Yeah, like and, you you lose your track, you get greedy. Yeah, and so that's just that's a huge issue is that the emotional swings are too much, and so most you know a lot of people really fail out. Like that's why trading is so so difficult to do. Uh, they've done some studies and essentially you're better off being a sociopath to trade 
right? Like really disassociated with emotion. You don't get the same ups and downs when you see losses and gains that a typical human response I would I feel warrant. like even the best investor has that issue where it's like, but I really like this company or this is something I'm like fond of. So I kind of tend to gravitate towards that area. That's the thing. It's, um, you know, you need a pretty disassociative emotional response. It's a fancy way of saying like, you need your emotions brain. are gonna kill you. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, but anyway, back to what can you do, right? Robinhood's an option now. You really can't get started at low dollar figures. You can start right. with 50 bucks. You don't even have to put 50 bucks a month in. It used to be that with mutual funds, you could say, well, if you do like $25 a month and set up a consistent automatic payment every month. They'd let you stay in it. They'd let you in, right? And so you'd set up a, you know, what they call an automatic reinvestment program. Mm -hmm. right? And so that would, or a systematic investment program, right? So that would mean you'd keep putting money in and you could do that. Um, now you've got all these other options. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the spread of options just getting started, right? Mutual funds are one of them. Right. Brokerage accounts like Robinhood with fractional trading are one of them. There's, a, there's another one out there called robo-advisors, mm. okay? And this, they, they, you can kind of get it in a similar fashion through mutual funds as well. But it's the idea that for small dollar figures, you can buy into an entire investment portfolio. Right. You see this in retirement plans all the time with what's known as target date funds. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, essentially, these are pre-built strategies, and they're fully diversified, and they're, they're risk managed so that uh, they, they hit a risk target. Uh, a target date fund, as that fund gets closer to its target date, will automatically shift to become more conservative as it gets uh, closer and closer to its maturity date. A target risk strategy will target a specific investment objective on a risk basis. So, oh, it's an aggressive investment. It's going to stay aggressive and it's going to make modifications, but stay in that aggressive category. Right. Uh, and so, the, the, and the robo-advisor is, is like, well, we'll go buy the, the mutual funds and automatically reinvest for you and keep them sort of in, in balance. Those are really ex expanded. There's a whole bunch of them out there. I was just trying to force AI to tell me how many do-it-yourself brokerage accounts were out there, and it just didn't want to give me a number. No. Nope. Right? And it's like, well, you know, there's like five or six of them here. I said, no, there's, how many are there? Dozens. Well, how many dozens? Uh, I don't know, somewhere between 24 and 60? Like, you're kidding, right? Like, so name 24 gets to 12. Well, you better name me 12 more, gets to there. Name me 12 more. It kept going, right? Kept this layering is, into this it. This is that thing I talked about on a prior episode. AI wants to conserve energy. It can do it, but at what cost? And so I think there's some sort of out, now this is just Matt's conspiracy Matt's, theory. Matt's conspiracy. But I think there's some sort of algorithm where when you put in a request for information, it's able to say to itself, okay, how much energy is it gonna take for me to process this? And then if it's over a certain threshold, it kind of like dumbs down the answer where it's like, well, like you said, I can give you a 24. Or, or it says, I'll give you enough and see if you go away. Right. <laughs> but the reality is you could use the same energy consumption that it's going to take to power a house for a day to give me the answer, but that's expensive, and so you're filtering me out. I am, I'm just laughing. because So what you're saying is AI is like a lazy teenager. It totally is. It's like, do your homework. All right, here you go. No, no, do your homework. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> hey, teenager, go run five miles. I'm going to run five steps and say I'm tired. Yeah, I'm going to go around the corner and see if you watch. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's AI for you. All right, so um, let's talk about next. I mean, I, I realize where we're at. We've talked about you know mutual funds is the way in. We've talked about a little bit about exchange traded funds, but that's not the purpose of today's show. Yeah, uh, kind of talk to me a little bit about. I mean, we've we've detailed a little bit of the option set that's out there, but kind of like how does someone look at their own situation and say, well, maybe I kind of gravitate towards this situation given where I'm at. Yeah. Like, is there like kind of a general broad spectrum of like kind of being able to know where you kind of fit? In, inside of these different products? There kind of is, right? Um, I, I feel like we could break that apart. Let's, let's, let's do this. We're at the point, we should probably grab our next break. Okay. When we come back, I wanna talk about, hey, let, let's paint a picture of where you might be and what some of the decisions are that go into selecting yeah, the right option. I like that. All right, stick around, we'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. Yeah, true well. On News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN. 
Come on, Matt, you can do it. Go, Crank Matt, it up. Go, Crank it up. Go, go. <laughs> We're just joking about it. It's the end of the day, and it's like, man, I should have had a bigger lunch or something. Well, um, maybe I had too big of a lunch. Maybe too big? Yeah. You anyway. have a whole big bowl of chili, and you're you're bound to be lethargic. Oh, geez. Well, I hope that, yeah, take your time with that chili. This is a small room. Uh, <laughs> okay. Hey, gang, we're, uh, we're talking about how uh, or where, what, what stage uh, might an investor be at and trying to, I guess we're really talking to the DIY investor today and what's available to you at different levels. And when you're just getting started, we've covered the idea that you know there's mutual funds and so forth. But I want to talk about the nuts, nuts and bolts for a minute. The things that I wish somebody had explained to me early on, like, how do I actually buy this thing? If I want to own something, I don't even know how to buy it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to use an example that's not a recommendation, but it's just a familiar name, Vanguard. Okay, if you wanted to buy an S&P 500 index, for example, Vanguard has both mutual funds and I think they also have an exchange traded fund that will mimic the index. Right. So what you would be able to do is go to Vanguard's webpage, and again, I'm not saying do this, but I'm saying this is how you would do it. You go to their webpage, you open an account with them, and then you're going to select what it is that you want to buy to put in that account and then they're gonna connect and you're gonna to have to put money in. So you're gonna to have to send money to Vanguard and they're gonna take that money and exchange it for share units in your account. So they're gonna put money in the account and then you're gonna take that money and they're gonna buy the mutual fund and then you're gonna get a statement that says, I now have an account that has this money in it, right? And this much of my index that I purchased. And then there's a lot of options from there. Right. And, and the thing is, they have a huge menu. Vanguard has dozens and dozens of different mutual funds. And so it's a huge menu to choose from. If you didn't like Vanguard, you could do the same thing by going to Fidelity, different mm -hmm. company. And you'd be opening an account with Fidelity in order to buy these things. And so the idea is you're opening an account with the mutual fund company, and then you're buying whatever is on their menu of options. Right. If you want mutual funds from different companies, you have one or two options. Open accounts with each different place, and then you have a whole bunch of different accounts, or you open one account that's a brokerage account. And that's like a holding tank, and then you use that brokerage account to then buy from all of the other mutual funds. And then you can get one account that can hold things from Fidelity, it can hold things from Vanguard, it can hold things from all over the place. And if you're gonna do that, so that's sort of what Robinhood is. Robinhood is a brokerage account or a custodian that allows you to use their system to go and buy different things. So you open an account with Robinhood, you put money in the account, and they do that by linking to your bank and just sweeping money out, and it's like a digital transfer. You know, click, click, money arrives in the account, and then that money is used to purchase things. Right. Okay. And the things are described by, they all have their own sort of nickname or their symbol when you're buying it. So how much, how many shares, how many dollars, what's the symbol I'm looking for? And all these different places have tutorials for how to do this. But that's mechanically what you do. You open an account, you fund the account, you use those funds to buy the assets that you want to own. You can open different types of accounts and that's how the taxes are gonna be treated. If it's a retirement plan, if it's a non-retirement plan and so forth. Um, where you open the account. There's lots of different places to choose from, right? We've talked about Robinhood. We've talked now Fidelity. They have right. brokerage environment. So, um, I guess Charles Schwab has right. brokerage environment. Um, E-Trade, e Ameritrade. If that's, I don't think they're around anymore. I think they right. got bought by Schwab. So I guess one of the questions that someone might have that's listening is, am I having to pay them for this? Like if I go and open the account and, and buy the funds, am I having to pay for it or... You know, should I be paying someone at all? It like, depends. Right. Right. Yeah, There's, the there question. may be fees associated with the account. There can be transaction fees. Okay. Right. When you buy or sell something, you can be charged a fee for that. So not let's talk always. about that. So there, there, what type of fees are there? How could those be paid? So you could, you could literally be forced to pay something just because you bought into it or because you sold it. Um, what are some other fees that you might come into? Like if you own a mutual fund, that might have a fee just to be in the fund, right? And so you could pay fees there as well. Well, mutual funds have an operating cost. Right. So you don't really see that. It's debited out of your return. 
Mm -hmm. Right, you know, if you put a hundred dollars in, right, but you're the, still the, you technically know, paying it. You're just not seeing the money. Yeah, I just try not to confuse our listener because you're yeah. not going to see somewhere on your statement. Oh, here's the fee I paid my mutual fund. What you're going to see is, oh, when I go to redeem this thing, they're going to take their fee out of it and then give me whatever the dollar figure is afterwards. So it's going to be sort of a, an invisible transaction to me, but and, I did pay them. Well, and different mutual funds have different fee structures. It Correct. could be a front-loaded one where you pay a bunch of money up front to get into it one time. Um, well, there's commission structures yeah. associated and so forth. And again, I, I, I we, think that our investors are they were pretty smart. You, you know, you, you got to know that if you're going to buy something, there may be transaction fees associated. There could be commissions associated, even without a broker, mm -hmm. just so you're aware. Uh, you know, without a person associated, you could still have fees buying things digitally, right? There can be, they're, they're called ticket charges, right? It's not a commission, because commission is a percentage of a transaction, right? So, oh, $100 and a 4% commission, I have $96 of investment after commission. But a ticket charge could be, I pay a dollar every time I make a trade. Right. Okay, well, then it doesn't matter if I spend $10 on the trade or $100 on the trade, it costs me a dollar. Right. Okay, that's a ticket charge. Um, other times, it's a per share charge. Uh, I think interactive brokers at one time, I don't know what it is now, but at one time it used to be at one half cent per share with a um, $1 minimum. Right. right. So I bought 250 shares, then that was going to be a two and a half dollar trade, right? Or $1.25 trade. Sorry, I had to do math. Well, um, and some places now are charging like a flat monthly fee, right, in order to have an account with them. That, so again, that, that it could, could be, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Right? Yeah. I don't know what they're, but the, the, the usually there there are there can be annual account fees just for keeping the account open, mm -hmm. and this kind of covers postage and stuff, which is a legal requirement to send you documentation of everything. Um, there can be account closing fees if you close things. There can be fees for moving money around, right? Especially if you're doing it by wire. The wire transfer fees um, can be can be there can be fees for certain assets that you buy. Maybe you're purchasing a bond. Bond mm -hmm. may have a different fee than buying a stock or a mutual fund. Right. So you, you do need to be aware of the fee schedule associated with the various custodians. They are not all created equal. Nope. Okay. And so while the concept, right, hey, what's a car? Okay, well, a car has four wheels and, you know, two to four doors and it's... Are you leasing the car? Well, but, but we know a car is not a truck. Mm hmm Okay. And we know, well, what's the difference between... So we know a car is not a truck, but then, well, what's the difference between a Chevy and a Ford and a Toyota? Ah, which kind of car? What features are you getting or not getting? Right? Mm -hmm. Is it a sports car or is it a sedan? Right? And then, you know, oh, well, an SUV is not a truck or a car. Oh, I think yeah, you're making right. a good point. They're not all the same. No, they not have by long similar time. features. Like some of the chassis is similar and they do same, similar things. And then there's differences. Mm -hmm. And as investors, you need to pay attention to those differences. Right? So, do you want to talk a little bit then about like how it's maybe different? self-directed where you're doing it yourself versus where you're hiring someone else to do it? Um, I or suppose we like have to now that you set the table okay. that way. I mean, what do you mean? Why don't you, since, since you brought this up, why don't you share with our listeners um, conceptually, right? I mean, it's, the, I think the chassis yeah. Kind of not all that dissimilar between DIY and having somebody else do it, but what are some of the things you're thinking of? Well, I mean, when you're doing it yourself, part of what you're having to do is some research, right? Like, or at least you should be, I, in my opinion. You're not just going to go in blind and say, well, I'm just going to click a bunch of buttons and buy a random set of things. So you kind of are having to spend your time figuring out what You're talking what about it deciding is. what to purchase. Yeah, there's a decision factor that goes yeah. into it, right? And I think that stacks on top of the original point of make sure that you've got, that you understand that, like, what are the costs associated with the chassis you select, mm -hmm. right? What, what custodian or what brokerage firm are you going to use? And now you're talking about, and then how are you going to decide what to buy? And you're right. Like, well, the DIY person is now responsible and, for figuring that out. And you might be completely competent in this. You know what you're doing. You know what it is that you want. And you are, maybe you're younger and you're like, hey, I'm going to be in this for a long period of time. I don't really feel like I need someone. I know what I want. And so you're perfectly fine to just go do that on your own. Whereas it could be different if you're maybe, say, closer to retirement and maybe you are unfamiliar with what these investments do, how they operate, and you don't have the time to figure out 
what is actually going on with these investments. And there's just a lot of complexity to your landscape. Someone who's just starting out, if you've got you know $5,000 and you're gonna plan to put $50 a month into something, maybe you don't need someone to you know do the planning portion of your you know your whole picture but maybe you do it really varies so yes i mean when we talk about why DIY versus why have somebody else it's the 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 question comes down to like there's a lot of things you're going to be responsible for if it's DIY um Let's do this. I'm looking at the clock. Let's grab our last break. When we come back, what I want to do for everybody is kind of lay out. Here's, some, here's the options. Here's the pros. Here's the cons of what you're using. But yeah, let's, let's take this last break. We'll stick around. And we'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you got True Wealth on News Radio 939 FM at 1240 KQEN. All right, gang, welcome back to the True Well Show. We've got the home stretch here, and um, we're talking at the break a little bit about how do we bring this home for everybody that's been listening today and, like, really make sense of it. And, Matt, mm -hmm. I think you brought up a great point in the last segment where, uh, you know, we're talking about the complexities of... Nah, complexity makes it sound really hard, right? But there's just... There's variables in right. picking a custodial environment. Like if you're gonna if you're gonna do this yourself, you got to figure out well where am I going to invest? Yeah, and there's and a bunch are, in the decisions there. People are trying to figure out what do I do? Right. How do I know what the right option is? And, and that's that's just one layer, right? The next mm -hmm. layer that you I think again you laid out is like then you got to go do it. Yeah. And there's all this stuff involved. And so uh, when I think about uh, like, like, what is the stuff that do it yourself or has to be able to, or doesn't they have to be able to? It's like, what's the stuff they're going to be responsible for, right? And so, yeah. like, you know, you talked about there's research, right? Right. Um, there's deadlines. You have to maintain it too. Yeah. Like, sometimes. I mean, some people just set it and forget it. But, I mean, what if you made a new contribution and it wasn't automatically set up to reinvest? And you just, and I actually saw that recently with someone. They had put, for nine years straight, they put all of their money into a retirement account, but they never set the investment up. And for nine years, it sat in cash. It did nothing. It was completely oh, uninvested. Oh, man. I saw that Seriously. two months ago. Yeah, nine years. I think that is probably the number. What was the thing I said at the beginning, right? What's the number one thing that impacts investors? Self-inflicted wounds. Self-inflicted wounds. Yeah. And that's one of them. And you could see the look on their face. They were mortified. Yeah. Nine yeah. years. They had over $100,000 in that account. What if they had just bought an index or like invested in a bond fund? Like what could they have instead of $100,000? Yeah, well, nine years, it pro arguably should be double what it was. Yeah. So it was a $100,000 mistake. Right. For, and, and this person was 30-something years old. Yeah. And it's not unrecoverable. That's not the point. The, but the point is, ouch. Yeah. The point is, ouch. Here's the thing, right? It, mistakes are possible. Professionals make mistakes too, but the probability drops. I think the issue that I get to, and we're allowed to say this, right? I'm just going to come right out with it. Like, we're advocates for working with pros. We are pros. We better be, mm -hmm. right? We better be advocating for that. If well, I'm sitting there going, like, go it. do it yourself, look, you can do it yourself. Will you? The question is, could you be in business for 12 years if you were completely horrible and made those similar mistakes over and over again? No, because word of mouth is going to be like, hey, that guy sucks, right? It's and like, true. We are, we're in too small a town. If you made too many mistakes, I mean, the word's going to get out. That's, yeah. Uh, I think that's kind of the bigger point, right? Like, yeah. And I think maybe that's something to consider, too. In all well, sure. And, and again, it's, the, the issue is not whether or not a financial pro can pick better investments than you. No. That, that's the misnomer. It's like somebody thinks, well, if I go to a pro, they should be able to sort of trade and make me gazillions of dollars. Like, no, you're, you're going at this for the wrong reason. Maybe that advisor is going to keep you from making huge errors that cost yeah. you. It's that. It's tax efficiency. It's actually following through and getting things done. That's mm -hmm. a huge one, right? If you don't get the follow through from your uh, advisor, that's a problem. 
Like mm -hmm. that's part of what you're hiring them for. So I think those are huge. I mean, when you were talking about research, Matt, I mean, that often falls under the phraseology of due diligence, right? Right. You know, what, what reason do you have for buying or selling something? Is there a reason? Right? right. I mean, beyond just like, I don't know, I used the force. It felt like the right thing to do. Well, here's one just kind of example. I, kn I knew someone that wanted to be an investor, but the only thing they were interested in was really, really speculative investments, where it's like, oh, I heard this thing from this guy that's a friend of a cousin, and it's <laughs> really going to take off. I know it, and I'm going to put $10,000 at this. And so they over-concentrated into something they really actually didn't know a whole lot about, mm -hmm. and it was just purely a speculation. And they kept doing that time and time again. And they're like, I'm an investor, I'm an investor. And I'm like, no, you're a speculator, and you're right. trying to win the lottery. Right. And there's a lot of people that have that lottery mindset that are involved in the stock market. And I'm like, not sure where the, the reputation that if you go to a stockbroker, they're going to just gamble. I hear yes. that word way too often. Oh, it's just gambling. It's just gambling. And I'm like, well, if you're just making all of your decisions based on some speculation, maybe you are a gambler. But I don't think that's really how these you know, bigger firms work where it's like, hey, we have liability in this too, right? Like, I don't think people get that. Well, and let's consider gamble for, I mean, it's gamble the same way, like if you plant a garden and you put zucchini in the ground, right? It's a gamble that you won't get zucchini next year. I mean, something could happen and famine or whatever, but it's a pretty good bet that you're going to get zucchini if you do the things that grow zucchini. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, it's, it's not like you plant zucchini and you're going to get, you know, tacos. Right. <laughs> it's like, it's going to be what you put in there. And so this idea that the cause and effect are not linked and it's all just a gamble, um, I sometimes think that's actually an excuse that people make. It's like, well, I'm not doing it. And I just want to rationalize why I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, They're scared of it or they don't know enough, so they just default yeah. to or worse. it's just you know you, there's somebody's unhappy about something so you just need to throw some rocks at it mm -hmm. it's we've all like i said everybody's made mistakes that's how you learn but uh it doesn't mean that investing is gambling no. right I, any more so than like well the u.s economy is gambling right mm -hmm. well you know we print money and the, the, you know we make stuff up policy wise all the time and see how <laughs> it works out okay then life is a big gamble yeah, if you make the definition broad enough, we're all gambling, I guess. Yeah. But it feels pretty disingenuous. No, you, I mean, you could make that silly argument for anything. I right. have to, I'm getting in my car to drive to work today. Oh, you're really gambling. There's a lot of car accidents. It's like, but I got to get to work. That's it, right? <laughs> like, I got to make money to have a retirement account so that I can live when I'm old. Is it really gambling? It's, it, I'll call them calculated risks, but I still continue to say the probabilities are in your favor, and that's why we keep doing it. Yeah. Uh, so it's back to, like, if you won't do this yourself, like, I, I actually love when, if somebody will do it themselves, like, then do it. Mm hmm Right? We like to do it. I mean, that's what, literally, we chose a career around it because we enjoy it. Uh, so it's not like you can't do it, it goes yourself, back to but the you car. have to, you it, need to do it. <laughs> it goes back to your car wash theory. Do you wash your car? Uh, no, not, not enough <laughs> because you don't want to do it. But will you take your car through a car wash? Yeah, yeah, and I will. Yeah, I will. And so and, you know, on occasion, I will wash my car because I it really needs to be done well. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like it's just not going to happen any other way unless I pay to have it detailed or something like that. There are times when we trade our time and our money. Yep. And, and I think this is no different. So, you know, anyway, we're getting to the tail end of this, of our time today. What are key takeaways, Matt? Like, what would you tell a, a, a startup investor right now, if you could just give well, them a high level? There's a lot of different investment options out there, probably more than ever before. And if you know what it is that you want and you have a plan in place and you're competent, go ahead and do it, right? There's a lot of cheap ways to do it. Um, for the person that doesn't have the time, maybe they have the knowledge, but they don't have the time, it's okay to reach out to someone and bring in someone to help you out. Or if you're scared of it, but you know, hey, I want to be an investor and I need help, or there's a lot of moving parts in my life, I need a second opinion, it's okay to reach out to someone. Yeah. I have something that's kind of exciting too. Uh, if 
We are, now it's not official yet, but I think we're we're looking at rolling out a new program under our roof that's mm -hmm. going to be useful for the startup investor. Right. So what I would encourage you is to keep track of our website. If you've got more questions, how can they reach us, Matt? Yeah, you can give us a call or a text at 541-375-0898, or just go to the website and chat us, uh, littlejohnfs.com. Right, so just reach out if you're just getting started, uh, got some different options that are uh, becoming available. But for now, we're out of time. So until next time, I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you've been listening to True Wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN.